Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Searching for the best precious metals deal? Shop with our trusted partner, Arc Silver. Access special deals on silver, gold, and platinum through our website or call 307 264 9441. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keats with goldsilverpros.com and I'm joined by a returning company, uh, Kraken Energy Corp, to the pro to the program and we have a uh, new CEO of the company, Matthew Schwab. Matthew, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Rob. Well, super excited to have you on because I know that you have a lot of experience in uranium energy. You had worked uh, with NextGen and uh, a lot of other similar type of projects. You definitely have a lot of experience there. Can you explain to people a little bit about your background and why you in particular found this pro these projects that Kraken has interesting? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've spent a lot of my career in energy in general, not just uranium, but oil and gas. So I started my career back in uh, 2008 with uh, Hathor Exploration out of Saskatoon. I was part of the development team that ended up selling off the Rough Rider deposit to Rio Tinto for $650 million. Um, I spent a little bit of time with Rio Tinto, not too much, and then jumped back into the junior market as the first geologist who signed on with NextGen Energy. I was the senior project geologist at the time of discovery for the Aero deposit. And uh, it was an exciting time. You know, everybody who knows anything about uranium knows the success story of NextGen Energy. Uh, from that point, I, I kind of went a different direction and started a few private consulting companies in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And then most recently started an international uh, exploration consulting firm with my business partner. And then very recently, two and a half months ago, started with Kraken Energy. So uh, I, I do have the background in uranium and a big point of why I came over to Kraken Energy was the familiarity with the team that was already in place, being uh, Garrett Ainsworth, Galen McNamara, Troy Beaujolais. And, you know, the experience that I gained in my time in uranium in Saskatchewan, I understand how valuable that is to building a company like this and recreating the successes that we're looking for. And having these people alongside me uh, is a very big point in, in why this company has a, a strong foothold in uranium. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, uranium is not, we haven't had a lot of uranium, I, I guess, produced in America for a long time. We're largely dependent upon foreign supplies of this. And, it, and it's very intriguing to me, companies that are coming back now, given that we've had a little bit of boom in terms of the Iranian market coming back and saying, okay, maybe it's time for us to start, you know, looking at some of these old projects and, and developing new ones. And, and maybe we get a little bit of energy independence here in North America. Um, and in terms of the overall market for uranium, it's interesting that it sort of rebounded after what seemed like almost 10 years of just kind of sitting there. And I know I originally wrote about uranium probably a decade ago when we were expecting some sort of boom in the market back then. It did take a long time. What do you suppose is the interest now, uh, Matthew, for uranium and, and why are we seeing a rebound in the market, do you think? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. The, uh, the uranium spot price is really based on the uh, uh, un unpredictability mm -hmm. uh, of the supply. And it comes from where the demand is coming from, right? And so now we're looking at things like the energy crisis happening in Europe. Uh, everybody sees that. We've got the ongoing conflict overseas. And these all really put a risk factor in place for supplying our countries with uranium, with uh, the United States needing 50 million plus pounds per year. And uh, China buying up, I think it was uh, 600 million, almost $600 million worth of uranium in the last couple of weeks. Um, countries in Europe putting incentives in place to start building more reactors, uh, reactors going back online across the world, it really puts a crunch on uranium supply and demand. And Nevada is a special case. Well, actually, the U.S. in general is a special case because they actually have a strong history of exploration and development for uranium projects over the last century. But it's been largely forgotten. It kind of, in the end of the 50s, when the incentives were taken away from the U.S. government, everybody shifted focus to the Athabasca Basin where there were higher grades and it made sense as an investment point of view. But now we're looking at this case where we have 70 years of projects that were developed and have been largely ignored. So it gives us a perfect exploration case to jump into Brownfield's exploration rather than Greenfield's exploration and de-risk ourselves a little bit while we're trying to develop this portfolio for cracking energy. Yeah, and, and I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what's going on geopolitically, you know, with sanctions and things like that. Has that affected 
um, do you think the view here in the Western world in terms of how we're going to secure our uranium, or are there concerns there that that maybe with some of the current supplies may not be quite as available to, to factors, you know, beyond the industry's control? Does it make sense that now we need to focus on developing projects over here? Absolutely. And I think that's a big part of why the U.S. government has recently announced up to $6 billion in incentives for the mm-hmm. development, production, and enrichment of uranium domestically in the continent of the U.S. Mm-hmm. Because previously, the largest portion of the uranium that's been coming to the U.S. for that 55 million pound necessity every single year has been coming from Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. So looking at the sanctions in place with Russia, even any ex-Soviet states come into play. And that, like I said, creates a big risk factor for supplying that demand that the U.S. needs. Now that it looks like the U.S. is back on board finally with looking for uranium and and maybe embracing nuclear power uh, going forward as as a grid power alternative, what do you think that that, that does for the uranium market here? Because I know the story was we always expected that to happen for years and it didn't. Now that the U.S. government's embracing it and there's creating this demand, do you think that companies involved in this space are going to have a bit of an advantage there? In other words, it's not just about the economics of the project. It's also about we've now created a new demand pro- profile here in the U.S. for that. And and what does that do for a company like you? You're just getting into expiration. Is it, it seems like it's really good timing more than anything. Absolutely, it is. So, like California is keeping their reactors online unexpectedly. Michigan may be uh, starting their reactors back up, and it's just going to be the profile across the U.S. I think, is, especially with small modular reactors becoming a, a thing all of a sudden. And it, realistically, I think that's going to be coming online in the next five years, give or take. So, with all this demand and the climate initiatives in place to remove oil and gas from the energy cycle we have to focus on nuclear energy. That, that's the only way that this is going to be satisfied. It's not going to happen through wind, solar, and, and hydro. It, it needs to be nuclear. And that gives us a perfect base case for not just us, but all of the companies out there who are trying to build these hub-and-spoke mining models through the U.S. to supply that demand. And I want to turn a little bit to how you guys have sort of run the company. Um, it, it's an, a, an opportunity for investors that they want to take a look at. And one of the things investors take a look at is how you've sort of managed um, the company itself. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how, how you've managed your shares. You guys, have, I, I think, have done a great job in the early going here of, you know, using your shares effectively. What's your strategy going forward? Because you guys, I know, are going to be do, do, drilling and development of this project. To, to or your both of your projects to get them up to speed. What should they expect in the next you know six to to twelve months, just from a capital structure perspective? Right now we're we're in a pretty uh, comfortable place. So we're fully financed for at least the next two, if not three, drill programs. Mm-hmm. So we're not looking to do any financing in the in the coming probably year. We'll see. Uh, but okay. we're we're happy where we are, and I, I think that uh, the the uh, investment uh, structure that we have is really suiting the direction that we're taking right now. So, Okay. So if you can, for just a few moments, walk us through the two properties. You have the former Apex mine, and then you have a, a new one called Garfield. They give us sort of a, the elevator pitch for both of those. How are they different and how are they going to strategically be a part of your portfolio moving forward? Yeah, for sure. So the company started before I came on board with the Apex property just outside of Austin, Nevada. It was a historically producing mine, actually started as a silver and gold mine back in the early 1900s. And in the 50s, when uranium mining came into play in Nevada, uh, the incentives came into place from the government. It uh, moved over to a uranium operation and produced 106,000 pounds of uranium at an average grade of 0.25%. From the reports that we looked at historically, it was largely underexplored and underdeveloped. And we've taken that property, staked it out, and then expanded it to over 3,000 hectares now. So we're looking at a large land package on that one with high historic grades. And we're moving it forward quickly. We've, uh, We've done a bunch of surveys over the summer. We did airborne radiometric and magnetic surveys. We're just kicking off a VTEM survey this week. And we did a soil sampling survey over the over the summer and just waiting on results from that right now. We plan to drill that one in Q2 of next year, uh, if all goes well, which it's looking like it will. 
And uh, like I said earlier, as part of the whole hub and spoke mining model, we needed to add more projects to the portfolio. So we, in a historic report, found that ore coming from our Garfield Hills property was being mixed with ore coming from the Apex property and sent to a central milling facility. So we staked that one as well. Uh, again, have expanded the land package over uh, 300%, I think it was. And we're currently drilling on that property. Everything's going really well right now. And we're concurrently flying a UAV magnetic and radiometric survey as well to expand the target uh, area that we have and keep building out as we go. And let's talk about the history of the Apex mine for a moment. I'm gonna share another slide that you guys had in the presentation, which I think is, is fascinating. Sure. Um, am I reading this correctly? 50% of the uranium output came from this mine in, in the past. Is that correct? Absolutely. So it was the biggest uranium mine in Nevada in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And we plan to make it even bigger. And I know you can't be too forward looking, but what do you anticipate that you guys have there without getting out information you, you're not, you can't right now? But in terms of your exploration, it, when we were there earlier and we did the site tour, it appeared as though it was a relatively small area that they had found uranium. They were working. It was just, you know, a really small area, but just high grade. But they thought that based upon the geology, this thing could get a lot bigger. Is that kind of what you see? You see the geology there that means you could really go beyond what it had produced in the past and maybe it could be become a little bit bigger operation. Is that possible? Absolutely. So the geology actually isn't all that complicated on the Apex property. It's a um, meta sedimentary package with intrusive rocks coming through it. And that's why we're flying the airborne geophysical surveys so that we can map these intrusive packages that come through the sedimentary layers across mm -hmm. the property. And it, it really has significant potential. We're, we're looking forward to getting these air to airborne surveys finished up so that we can fully interpret the geology and understand how extensive it could be across the mountain range. Yeah, it looks here like up on the screen Somebody, you know, the Nevada Bureau of Mines really liked it. <laughs> they thought, you know, this a is lot a of people project. have liked it over the past. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about Garfield. This is a newer project for you guys. Um, understand the hub and spoke model. A, a lot of uranium companies, by the way, in the U.S. are doing that. They're finding multiple projects, you know, going to set up a mill in the middle and truck it all. Um, but why did y'all, why did y'all jump on Gar? Or why did you feel like you needed to jump on Garfield? You've got a great project, Apex, it appears. It was was that strategic and saying, hey, we want more than one project because we want to, you know, get out of the gate and and become a bigger operator? Or was it just that it was so attractive to get? I mean, it was just an asset that was sitting there and you're going like, I mean, that's a great asset. We might as well pick it up. I mean, is it purpose driven to where <clears throat> you're going to mine these both at the same time or kind of give us a picture of, of how that will work? It, it's kind of a mix of everything you just said there. So, yes, it's very strategic in us building on a larger portfolio of properties. Uh, we're not going to stop at Apex and Garfield Hills. We're constantly looking at new staking opportunities, new acquisition opportunities, not just in Nevada, but also the surrounding states. And we do plan on having a, a model built out where all of them or many of them can be mined at the exact same time, brought to a central milling facility, similar as it's been done in the past. And other companies are also doing in the United States right now. But the values themselves, like the uranium values that came from this property, were very attractive. So the first two drill holes that we saw from historic reports were 0.26 and 0.18% U through 8, both over 14 meter intervals. So again, uh, the geology is quite simple at Garfield Hills. Uh, we've got a overlying flood basalt and then a very consistent sedimentary package, sandstone, the Dunlop sandstone with an underlying intrusive unit. And the sandstone is the unit of interest. And it kind of lays flat across the entire property, except where there's an intrusive coming through. So if we can build that out, prove up the resource like, you know, like you we're looking at on the screen there, um, we're very confident that this is going to work out and, and build a significant resource on Garfield Hills. Right, very good. So what should, well, also one thing I wanted to mention since the gold silver channel, uh, the apex mine area, there is a little bit of gold and silver there. So th there's a little bit of history of gold and silver being involved. If you guys run in some gold and silver, what do you expect you're going to do? Are you just going to, you know, sell it, produce it, sell it and use it as a byproduct credit? Or will you bring somebody in to kind of take care of that for you? That's undecided at the moment, but there's definitely value added metals on the property. So historic reports of up to 7,300 grams per ton silver, 15 grams per ton gold. So it, it's a point of interest, 100%, and we'll definitely capitalize on it as best as we can. Yeah, just those grades. I mean, if they were to hold throughout the 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 project, you're looking at 
you're looking at gold and silver that's very significant. I mean, those grades are very significant in and of themselves for gold silver. So I would imagine if you if that's consistent throughout the field, you guys are going to have that that would be a very major but uh, addition to your bottom line, I would assume. Uh, Absolutely, because there, and, there are a lot of primary gold and silver mines that don't have those kind of grades. Yeah, and it's a good point because in the past, when it was a gold and silver mine, they weren't assaying for uranium. When it was a uranium mine, they weren't assaying for gold and silver. <laughs> so right, we'll yeah. be assaying for everything across the board to make sure that we're capitalizing on that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I think is most important and what I put in my guide for our followers in terms of investing in the mining equity space is management. And to me, it's the single most important factor in terms of whether the project whether the project's going to make money for investors because you could have a great project but if it's not managed well and we've seen this a bunch of times maybe we don't get the value out of it and sometimes the new management team comes in you know the opportunities there the markets there uh they hit the ground running and, and you have a home run there um it, it just seems to me that you guys have assembled a great team so talk a little bit about your team and the value that they bring and why this is sort of an all-star team in terms of uh, the uranium uh, sector. Absolutely. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so I chatted a bit about myself and my own history. Um, Garrett Ainsworth, he's very well known in the industry. He worked with Alpha Minerals, uh, Fission Exploration, and uh, or Fission Uranium, sorry, as well as ESO. He's found multiple deposits across the Athabasca Basin and been a large success in his own right. Galen McNamara, he came on uh, with Next Gen Energy as well, early stage, and has gone on to become CEO of Summa Silver, chairman of multiple companies. Uh, Tro Troy Beaujolais, he's got a very extensive history in uranium. Uh, he was, came from Cameco, moved over to Next Gen Energy uh, shortly after my departure, and then again has become CEO of Murchison Minerals. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a strong background in people who are running junior exploration companies successfully. They, they all come from a uranium background and, again, have that same experience that, that I found at Next Gen Energy and Hathor Exploration and Rio Tinto, which really builds the foundation for our company. Yeah, it really, really does. And there's a lot of things to be excited about. What, why I got excited about this one is you can tell there's there's the mine there, the, the resources there. It looks like you guys have a great team. It looks like Nevada is going to allow you to mine this. And, you know, Nevada is known for its gold and silver. You guys may put Nevada on the map in terms of uranium again, because it hasn't been done in, I guess, 60 years. Uh, th this would be huge, I would also think, for the state of Nevada and and people recognizing that, hey, you know, they have energy resources there, you know, and that makes a lot of sense. You guys could put them on the map for sure. So it's definitely something, you know, that I want to follow and that I have a keen interest in. But can you let people know if they're interested in your company, how they go about accessing, you know, your shares? What What exchanges do you guys trade on? We trade on the CSE as UUSA and the OTCQB as U UUSAF. Awesome. Well, Matthew, uh, thank you so much for coming on. It was awesome to talk to you and get an update on how the company is doing. We certainly enjoyed you know, our field visit out there earlier in the year and would love to <laughs> next year, if you guys are going to do it again, you know, come back out and, and maybe do an update. Absolutely. We might actually do one mid-drilling season if you're interested. So. Yeah, absolutely. Let me know. I'm going to be globe trekking a lot this year, <laughs> hitting different mines. Perfect. So definitely want to get this one on the calendar since it's right in my backyard. That'd be fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthew.